Hello and welcome to the Friday, August 16th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. DDK took a closer look at a malicious Word document that was recently used in a more targeted spear phishing attack and uh, well actually Proofpoint wrote about the attack itself. What DDK did was take his well-known scripts to analyze this document and show how to overcome various obfuscation techniques used in this particular case. Sort of interesting here and not really unusual is that the actual malware was sort of encoded as a PM file format. So PM is often used in certificates, but the reason attackers like to use this particular format on Windows is that they can use CertUtil, which is typically used to read certificate files that are PM decoded to decode the file and then create the executable. This of course is uh, also supposed to evade some of the simple signature based detection because you no longer see the typical PE header that you have in Windows executables. On the other hand, as DDA points out, with uh, PM certificates, the first letter actually should be M. But uh, if you have another file just encoded as a PM certificate, that's no longer the case. So that's actually something that could be used as a signature to find these odd or invalid PM certificates. And I think pretty much every week we have a couple of IoT security issues or failure of Internet of Things security. Actually, I remember last week I didn't cover a couple stories that were kind of interesting just because I figured, well, uh, we had too much IoT security already to talk about. And well, uh, you probably noticed it keeps repeating some of the issues that are showing up. Well, if you just thought that the issues keep repeating, there's now some confirmation here from Sarah Satko with the Cyber Independent Testing Lab. They did a pretty monumental effort. They looked at 6,000 different firmware versions, ranging all the way from 2,000 2003, sort of the beginning of the Internet of Things to 2018. And essentially what they were looking for is, was there any change in software security when it comes to sort of these Internet of Things? And they focused a lot on the routers. They looked at Aces, D-Link, Linksys, Netgear, Ubiquiti, and a total of, I believe, 18 different vendors like that. What they found in conclusion was that they cannot detect any sort of concerted effort by vendors that pretty much thinks today are as bad as they were 15 years ago. This of course contradicts some of what the vendors are stating that they're focusing more on security. But then again, if you're looking at recent vulnerabilities, it's really not all that different. Now, in order to do their test, of course, they had to rely on heavily automated tests. So they focused on things that are easy to verify, like for example, StatGuard, ASLR, and sort of all these little compiler tricks that prevent exploitation. I don't see any note here of things like you know, default passwords and such. Possibly they tested it too. I haven't really seen the complete report yet, but uh, that's something that may have gotten a little bit better in recent years. With bots like Mirai, of course, not really giving you a choice when it comes uh, to default passwords. And Kaspersky Antivirus made it apparently easier for websites to track users. Now, this wasn't probably the intention of this particular feature, but what happened here was that if you use Kaspersky Antivirus, Kaspersky will parse all web pages that you browse and it will inject a line of JavaScript. Now, this JavaScript isn't really malicious. What it does is, for example, in Google search results, it will add little green icons if a site is known to be safe to essentially warn a user that if they click on a certain link, they may reach an unsafe 
page. But the way this was implemented was that the JavaScript itself included the unique user identifier as part of the file name. And since this JavaScript was now part of the web page, other JavaScript code within the same page was able to read this code and with that also read the unique identifier that Kaspersky added. This apparently was added late in 2015, kind of odd that it took so long for it to be discovered. Kaspersky since has fixed this issue and you may still see a similar formatted ID, but it should now be the same for all users of a particular version of Kaspersky. Still not great, I guess, that uh, someone could figure out that you are running Kaspersky, so they could, uh, for example, then just an exploit or so in order uh, to bypass uh, this particular antivirus tool. Well, and that's it for today. And uh, by the way, Wednesday next week, I will speak at the Tech Coast conference here in Jacksonville. So if you're interested, stop by. I'll try to remember to take some stickers uh, with me as usual. Techcoast.com is the website for the particular conference. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.